Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created to the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's hey! a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your this mind. This is the first poll that we've seen conducted entirely after Joe Biden uh, rolled out that video last Thursday, Allison. And there is the horse race, as you said. Joe Biden way out in front. 39% uh, of wow. Democrats are backing him. 15% for Sanders. And you see the next four, Warren, Buttigieg, O'Rourke, and Harris, all sort of grouped together in that, in that next tier. Let's look at where they were last month in our poll compared to now. And look at that Biden movement. That's 11 points higher than he was just a month ago. This clearly is a bounce out of his rollout, out of his announcement. The only other candidate to make a big jump, Buttigieg, went from 1% to 7%. But you see Warren hold steady, O'Rourke and Harris go from double digits to single digits. Even Bernie Sanders went down a bit, all to the benefit of Biden and a bit to Buttigieg. Here is one thing I want to sort of caveat, just so uh, folks are aware, where the support is coming from. Look at this. Among white Democrats versus non-white Democrats, Joe Biden's commanding lead is being fueled by this huge lead among non-white voters. He's at 50% compared to Sanders at 14. He's still leading among white voters, but not by that huge margin that he is among non-white voters. Wow, that is really something. That is really telling, isn't it? No. <laughs> it's very early. But we do have three polls today, three of them. Uh, there is a CNN poll. Obviously, that is what they were uh, going, uh, you know, going through the numbers there. That's the CNN uh, internal poll. Biden is at 39 percent and 50 percent of non-white voters support Joe Biden. Uh, that's... Um, that's really a lot. I have to tell that is that is that that is just I don't know why somebody's going to have to tell me. I, I guess uh, I need to open the phones to black women today. Why black women aren't supporting Kamala Harris or why black women are supporting Joe Biden and uh, why black women really don't like Bernie Sanders. I mean, I'm not clear about uh, the reason. So, you know, you could fill me in. But Biden's got 39 uh, percent of, of the polling, 50 percent of non-white Democrats are going to support Biden at this early stage. Bernie is down to 15% support. Elizabeth Warren in the CNN poll gets 8% support. Buttigieg is uh, 7%, Beto 6%, and Kamala only gets 6% uh, of the uh, Democratic, uh, you know, so far early, uh, you know, people who are paying attention. And then shortly after CNN came out with their poll, Quinnipiac came out with their poll. And it's almost identical. Uh, Biden in the Quinnipiac poll gets 38 percent. Warren actually does better than Bernie in the Quinnipiac poll just by a little. They kind of flip places. Uh, Warren gets number two uh, with 12 percent support. Sanders, 11 percent. Buttigieg, 10 Kamala, uh, 8%, and O'Rourke, 5%. And then there's a New Hampshire poll out where Biden gets 36%. Sanders gets 22%. And Warren only gets 9%. I'm not sure what this is. Uh, is it name recognition? Uh, is I don't know. But the, the number that jumped out to me is how much support from non-white voters uh, Joe Biden is uh, getting. <clears throat> and it's interesting to me because, you know, that whole crime bill, 1994, you know, just got to say that was uh, that's that's going to be the same exact argument that uh, was leveled against Hillary. That's going to be leveled against Joe Biden. So I'm not real clear, but uh, someone will explain it to me. Meanwhile, uh, Bernie has an op ed in USA Today today t uh, defending his position on incarcerated people getting the right to vote uh, not stripped away from them. And it's very simple, you know, uh, where he just says our, our, our country has a terrible uh, record on voter suppression and that uh, after uh, Jim Crow, uh, you know, and the ratification of the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments, um, which gave civil and uh, legal protections to formerly enslaved people, a lot of the states decided that they would make new felonies. And they did. They created new felonies to put black people in jail. 
And then they instituted a lifelong disenfranchisement rule to go along with if you've ever been in jail. So you, ain't, you, you, you create new felonies, you, <laughs> you target African-American people, you lock them up, and then you say, oh, and by the way, you've given up uh, your, your, your enfranchisement. You've given it up for the rest of your life. Now, this country is very, uh, you know, uh, uh, inundated with mass incarceration, you know. And so what you have here is four and a half million Americans who are, and they are disproportionately people of color who cannot vote. They have lost their right to vote. So some states have done, uh, you know, better. Florida had Amendment 4, as you know. 64, I believe, 64 percent of Floridians <clears throat> showed up in the last election and restored people who had served their time's voting rights. And now the Republicans in the state house and the Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, they want a poll tax on those people who have had their rights restored by virtue of the people voting to restore their voting rights, right? Um, so now they want them to have paid every bit of restitution, all their legal bills, because you know here you gotta pay your public defender before they get their right to vote. So that's just another way to disenfranchise people after the voters have spoken. In Georgia, you have a uh, Republican governor who instituted barriers uh, so that uh, Stacey Abrams, she still thinks she won because of the mass voter disenfranchisement effort that was, uh, you know, uh, done there. It wasn't even attempted. It was, uh, you know, it was achieved. Tennessee, they're trying to shut down groups who do voter registration work. New Hampshire and Iowa, they're trying to make it harder for college students to vote. I mean, the, the people who ripped us off on Wall Street in 2008, these are the real crooks. And yet we don't take away their right to vote, do we? Oh, hell no. And that's what Bernie Sanders was talking about. So I'm not sure why this is that he doesn't get the support of people whose issues he actually takes up. So it's interesting. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, she's very policy heavy. She has a way of paying for things. She lays out plans to uh, take the, the yoke of debt off of our young people who have done nothing but educate themselves. She puts out a plan. It's clear how she would pay for it. She puts out, a, I mean, Bernie, it's clear how he would, uh, you know, pay for Medicare for all and how much money we would all end up saving and how it would be a boom to this economy because people would have more money in their pockets to spend on this so I'm not really sure. And then, you know, but Joe Biden, um, he he showed up and everybody's like, yeah, I like Joe. I want Joe. I, I need Joe. Joe is my guy. I love Joe. Uh, Uncle Joe. Uh, Uncle Uncle Joe. I mean, it, it, it's it's just so strange. But anyway, uh, this was what he said um, in Pittsburgh yesterday. Let me tell you why I chose Pittsburgh to uh, begin this effort. I believe that Pittsburgh and my native town of Scranton and my hometown of Wilmington and Claymont, they represent the cities and towns that made up, make up hardworking middle-class Americans who are the backbone of this nation. That's not hyperbole, the backbone of this nation. I also, uh, I also came here because, uh, quite frankly, folks, if I'm going to be able to beat Donald Trump in 2020, it's going to happen here. It's going to happen here. There are three basic reasons why I'm running for President of the United States. The first is to restore the soul of the nation. And the second is to rebuild the backbone of this nation. And the third is to unify this nation. We always do better when we act as one America. Today, today I want to speak about the second of these three, and that's rebuilding the backbone of America. And that is that we have time, uh, all my time in public life from us, I've gotten involved I've been referred to as middle-class Joe. It's not always meant as a compliment. It's usually that I'm not sophisticated. That's why I'm middle-class Joe. But the fact of the matter is, I'm awfully sophisticated about why, how, and who built this country. Let me say this simply and clearly, and I mean this. The country wasn't built by Wall Street bankers, CEOs, and hedge, and hedge fund managers. It was built by you. It was built by the great American middle class. Well, all true enough, but the destruction of unions is pretty much what destroyed the backbone. It's what destroyed the middle class. 
And there's been this consistent hacking away at unions over the past decades to the point where only 10% of U.S. workers are unionized, meaning they can't collectively bargain for better wages. School teachers across this country have walked out. Strikes are becoming something you can see again. How, 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 how does he, how does he sell us this? Go to randyroads.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.